Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm an academic, so many of the participants in the conference that I've heard are from a law enforcement perspective. So my perspective will be a little bit different because, of course, from a law enforcement perspective, one's top priority is to detect the culprits and preferably to detect them before they uh, commit uh, radical violent uh, acts. Um, and that's, of course, uh, tremendously important. I don't want to challenge that at all. Uh, but from a social science perspective, uh, the question that stands at the center of attention is the one of the root causes of uh, terrorist violence. And I want to limit this to, uh, to religious ter terrorist violence here. Um, but of course, the story holds uh, very, to a very, for, uh, very similarly also for, uh, for political uh, forms of um, uh, extremism. So what I want to talk about is uh, the religion in uh, religious extremism, so the religious ideology behind uh, religious uh, extremism. Uh, and in doing so, I will also uh, say something about uh, the relationship between homegrown uh, terrorism and the terrorism, uh, the much uh, numerically much larger and more deadly terrorism uh, that happens in uh, the Islamic world. And I will do so on the basis of a large uh, study that we've done uh, one and a half years ago in, uh, in seven uh, countries uh, across three uh, religions. And the main question of that study is whether uh, religiously motivated violence has anything to do uh, with religion. And there are some uh, strong opinions on that uh, in uh, the public debate. I mean, there are those who say that it has everything to do uh, with religion, uh, that it is inherent uh, to Islam, for instance. Uh, that's not a point of view that I share, nor one that I want to pay much attention to. I want to pay much more, more attention to the opposite view, namely that this religiously motivated violence has nothing to do uh, with religion. And not the least of politicians have in the past um, um, advanced uh, that view. Just two quotes here from uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, from uh, Barack Obama. And this is certainly not uh, just something uh, uh, from politicians in the United States or even politicians on the on the left or liberals. Uh, you can hear, you, I could produce similar quotes from, say, David Cameron or, uh, or Angela Merkel uh, in Germany. So it's not a left-right issue, I think. There's a very general uh, tendency to, to deny uh, the religious component in religious extremism. Um, but of course, uh, anyone who has been raised religiously knows that uh, faith sometimes does teach people to massacre innocent civilians. Um, and I'll present you here two quotes, one from uh, the Bible, um, uh, the Torah and the Old Testament of the Christian uh, Bible, the book uh, Deuter Deuteronomy, where it says, when the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, put the sword to all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. And you may, you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are, that are at a distance from you and that do not belong to the nations nearby. So this is basically be nice to everybody who belongs to your own group. And those who are outside your group, you can basically um, do whatever you want. And this is, of course, you know, this is the recipe that, that ISIS follows, for instance. And it's, it's in the Bible. Um, and, of course, you can find very similar things uh, in uh, the Quran here from Surah 2. A very uh, often uh, used quote, uh, if you read um, 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 documents by uh, terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda and IS, it's actually there's even a quantitative study on the use of quotes from the Quran by Islamic religious extremists, and this is actually uh, the quote from the Quran that is most often used. Uh, when the forbidden months are passed, then fight and slay the pagans wherever you find them, seize them, beleaguer them, and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war. But if they repent and establish prayers and play, pay the alms, then open the way for them, for God is forgiving, merciful. So, the question of the study is, what is the impact of there being such um, uh, statements in uh, the religious scriptures of all the three Abrahamic religions, and I'm pretty sure that if you would go to non-Abrahamic religions, you could also delve up um, similar types of quotes that legitimate violence against civilians. And of course, we also know from the testimonies uh, of terrorists that they actually base their actions on such uh, uh, biblical uh, or Quranic uh, quotes. 
this is uh, Yigal Amir, the murderer of Yitzhak Rabin, who in uh, the trial uh, against him um, was very extensive and open about uh, what he saw as the biblical uh, legitimation uh, for uh, his acts. Uh, and you can, okay, you can, I, guess I could show you very similar uh, statements from uh, people in the United States who killed uh, abortion doctors who see themselves legitimated and present Bible quotes to legitimate their acts. And of course, if you read, say, the, the writings of Osama bin Laden, it's also full, full of uh, Quran quotes. And still, we have a tendency to say, well, this is all just misuse uh, of religion. It is not something that has actually uh, a motivating force. So the research question uh, that I want to uh, address with you today is whether there is a, a relationship between support for religious violence and these violence legitimations in uh, religious scripture. Uh, and there, of course, the question is also, you know, the use of such violence uh, legitimizing, uh, legitimizing uh, uh, elements of scripture, is it just something tactical? You know, terrorists want to kill people for some other reason, and then it just sounds good to provides a uh, uh, quote from the Holy Scripture to give a legitimizing veneer uh, to your base uh, motives, um, or whether there is actually some causal role played by uh, religion. Uh, and a very important question is, what is the role of religious fundamentalism? Because I do not want, I'm myself from, from a religious background, although I would not consider my, myself a believer anymore, but I, I respect religion. But I don't respect certain types of religion, namely religious fundamentalism. I'm, I'm going to talk uh, to you uh, later about what exactly uh, uh, defines uh, religious fundamentalism. Um, and the question is to what, to what extent fundamentalist forms of religion, and one of the most important uh, uh, characteristics of fundamentalism, is taking scripture literally and in implementing it literally, seeing it as something timeless that is as valid in the present as it was in the past. Um, that of course makes, or at least may make, that's the research question, so we'll see, but that may make uh, religious fundamentalists especially uh, prone uh, to be motivated by uh, violence legitimation uh, found in religious scripture. Uh, a question that I also want to address in this study is, what role does religious knowledge play? There too, uh, a lot is said with an awful lot of confidence about uh, the role of religious knowledge, and the usual story is that terrorists have no clue about their religion. Even though they copiously cite religious scripture, they know religious scripture better, I would say, than the average Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, but still the claim is these are people that Oh, they don't have a clue. If they would have a clue, the claim is, they wouldn't do these things because you know, religion is peaceful and tolerant, etc. I don't think that's actually what history teaches us. So the question is, if history wasn't like that, why should it be different in uh, the present? Um, and then uh, finally, the question whether there's any, anything specific uh, about Islam in, this re in these regards. And uh, as a caveat right uh, at the start, I want to say, if I ask this question, I'm talking about Islam in its current state. I mean, we can have a long discussion and I would immediately agree with you that, you know, the state of Islam nowadays uh, is not representative for the history uh, of Islam and there were periods in the history of Islam where Islam was much more tolerant than the Christian world, was much less anti-Semitic than the Christian world, etc., etc. But uh, I'm talking about Islam as it exists in the world today, real existing Islam, if you want, not some idealistic uh, picture. So, um, this is the design of the study with uh, the seven countries. So these include two uh, immigration countries, Germany uh, and uh, the United States, uh, and a number of uh, countries where uh, we study different religious groups um, in, their, um, um, uh, in their own native country, although Israel to some extent is of course also an immigration country, at least where the Jews uh, are concerned. Uh, and the nice thing about the study is that in all seven countries, we have at least two uh, religious groups. Uh, in some, uh, namely in Israel and the United States, we even have three uh, religious groups. Although the Christians, as you see, are very small in number in the, in the sample in Israel, so I will not take them into account, uh, as is also the case for the Christians in Palestine, uh, which are even less in number. 
So we're able to con basically control for the country context and compare. It's West Bank and Gaza, yeah, both. And East Jerusalem also. So the Palestinian the definition of Palestine, if you so wish. Um, so what we did in the experiment uh, is to, uh, to try and find uh, quotes in the holy scriptures of the three Abrahamic religions that are structurally equivalent. Now that is very easy for uh, Judaism and Christianity because they share the Old Testament basically, so we can take the same quote. Um, and that's also a quote from, uh, from uh, Deuteronomy, a different one than the one I read before. I'm not going to read it to you, it's very long, we don't have that time, but you can hopefully read what it says. Uh, and we found a, a quote in the Quran, in uh, Surah 5, uh, which is structurally equivalent in the sense uh, that it legitimates the use of violence against people who insult God and, and, uh, and uh, disobey uh, the laws of God. Um, and from these, to make, to, to make uh, the experimental condition really equal across uh, different groups, we distilled from these long quotes a shorter uh, sentence which conveys the, the message uh, of them and which is then the same for the three uh, religious groups. Um, and it reads uh, in the treatment condition that you see below there. I'll read it for, say, the, in the Christian variant. You can you know, translate it to the other two religions uh, easily. So according to the uh, Bible book Deuteronomy, uh, those who cause mischief and do evil in the eyes of God should be killed. So that is the treatment, a, re, a, a quote from a religious scripture. And after this treatment comes a question. What do you personally think? Should people who cause mischief and do evil in the eyes of God be killed? The control condition gets that question, namely what do you personally think, without uh, the uh, religious quote. So now if, if these quotations in uh, religious scripture have no influence on people's attitudes towards uh, violence in the name of religion, we should find basically that there is no difference between the treatment and the control condition. If, however, it does make a difference if you present people with a legitimation for violence from a religious scripture, then we should find that more people uh, are inclined to say, yes, I personally think that people who cause mischief and do evil in the eyes should be killed. And uh, I jump right away to uh, the findings. Uh, let's first look on, on the left, uh, the results across all seven countries. In blue, you see the results for the Christians, in green, those for Muslims, and in purple, those uh, for Jews. Uh, and what you see, uh, first of all, for all three religious groups, there is a significant, statistically significant, uh, treatment effect. So in all three religious groups, we find that people who are presented with a religious quote are significantly more likely to say that they personally think that people uh, who do evil in the eyes of God should be killed. You can also see that the size of the treatment effect uh, differs. Uh, it's very small for uh, Jews and for Christians, and it's quite large uh, for the Muslim group. And you can also see that there is a big difference in the baseline level of support uh, for those who don't get the quote, uh, who are asked the question. Uh, there you see that 28% uh, of the Muslim respondents even spontaneously uh, say that they uh, would, uh, that they support that people who disobey the laws of God should be killed. And when you present the Quran quote, this increases to 47%, which is almost half uh, of the Muslim respondent population. Now, if you look at the individual countries, you see that there is also huge, huge cross-national uh, variation. What you also see is that the basic pattern, uh, the differences between the three religions, um, is the same in every country, where uh, you can make a comparison between two or, or three in the case of the United States. So this finding that it's much, uh, that the baseline level and also the impact uh, of the treatment is stronger for Muslims is basically represented in all countries. But we have very different, very uh, strong differences in, in the levels. Um, and what you see is that especially in um, Germany, uh, Cyprus, the USA, USA and Israel, we have much lower levels of support uh, for violence uh, in all uh, religious groups. And in Lebanon, Kenya, and uh, Palestine especially, we have uh, very high levels uh, of such support, support. So country context clearly matters as well, but uh, religious background also matters, and the treatment uh, 
condition also matters. So now I come to the, to the question, to what extent are these uh, results explained by uh, religious fundamentalism? And we measure uh, religious fundamentalism by, by eight different uh, items which are well established within uh, the literature on religious fundamentalism, which is uh, cross-religious. There are studies of religious fundamentalism in, in various religions and the validity of these scales has also been established in um, different uh, religious uh, groups. Uh, you see several or several elements. Uh, the first, for instance, stating that the rules of the Holy Scripture are more important than uh, the laws of the country, the secular laws of the country in which one lives. Then there is this idea uh, of the, that the Scripture needs to be taken literally. Uh, the idea of the superior, superiority also of the own uh, religion. And the idea that we're living uh, in a time uh, where there is a final battle between uh, the adherents of the one and only true religion and uh, the forces of evil. I mean, anybody who is like me from a Christian background will probably know uh, the book of Revelations uh, at the end of the New Testament, which is about this end time. And that's uh, that, that, that millenarian end time thinking, the thinking in terms of the final battle, is something that you find very, very widely uh, in, in religious fundamentalist extremist uh, groups. ISIS uh, is, is very explicit in that, but you can basically find it in, in almost all uh, religious extremist groups. Um, and in, in, in terms of the prevalence uh, of uh, uh, fundamentalist religious views, uh, there is a, a strong difference again between uh, the three uh, religions. Uh, it is least uh, found among the Jews, um, then come the Christians, and then uh, at a much higher level, and again, this is represented, this is, you find this in any of the, in any of the seven countries uh, where you study it, um, fundamentalism is most widespread among Muslims. Again, there are also, in terms of fundamentalism, big country differences. For instance, Christians in Kenya tend to be more fundamentalist than Muslims in Germany. So it's not just a question of religion, but within every country, it is very clear that Muslims are always more fundamentalist than Christians or uh, Jews. Um, and here you see um, uh, the impact of fundamentalism on uh, violence legitimation. So no team between the uh, means uh, the non-treatment, so the control condition, T means the treatment uh, condition, and on the left you see the non-fundamentalists uh, in the sample, uh, and on the right you see the fundamentalists uh, in the sample in the three religious groups, and what you see immediately is that levels of violence legitimation are much higher among fundamentalists, and what you see is that especially among um, the Jews and Muslims, there is also a much stronger treatment effect among uh, the fundamentalists. Then religious knowledge, that's of course something very difficult uh, to measure and it's especially very difficult uh, to measure it in uh, uh, equivalent ways across different religions because the knowledge uh, is of course different, obviously. Um, we found actually one question that, the, that we asked that we could, could apply to all three uh, religions because the, st the story of, of Abraham and Isaac plays a role uh, in all three, although they're called under different names. So we asked, who was the, what was the name of the son that God asked uh, Abraham to sacrifice? And we gave four options and people had to pick the right uh, option. Uh, and then we had um, two questions for Christians in addition, uh, what happened on Pentecost uh, and which of the uh, four, Peter, Jude, Judas, uh, Luke or Simon, was not one of the 12 apostles. Quite a difficult question, it turned out. <laughs> Many people didn't know it. Uh, and we have also two additional questions for Muslims and two for Jews. So with these three questions, we measure uh, the level of religious knowledge. This is very basic religious knowledge. Of course, in the, in the public discussions about religious knowledge, it, it is often used in a tautological way, in the sense that, well, um, Islam or Christianity is peace, so anybody who uses violence in the name of Islam or Christianity automatically has uh, little knowledge of the religion. But that is, of course, not knowledge. Knowledge is basically knowing what is in the scripture. Uh, and how to interpret that is a different question, but that's not a question of knowledge. Uh, so here we have three very factual questions about core elements, core stories in each of the uh, three uh, religions. And we find quite some uh, variation also. Some people know all the answers. Some people, even though they say they're religious, don't know any of the answers, strikingly. Um, and uh, again, we can look 
uh, what the relationship is to um, uh, violence uh, legitimation. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting towards the end. Uh, and yeah, basically you see the same as for religious fundamentalism, but in a, in a surprising direction maybe uh, for uh, some of you, namely that overall, uh, at least among Muslims, we find that greater knowledge of the content of the Quran is actually associated with greater uh, legitimation of violence. Among Christians, we find that it doesn't make much of a difference. And among only among Jews do we find that the common story is true, that the, the better you know the Torah, the least likely uh, you are uh, to uh, legitimate violence. Well, here you see the result of uh, regression analyses that do this, all, this, all this in a multivariate context and also look, look at whether there are independent effects of fundamentalism and knowledge. The basic story is very strong effect of fundamentalism. Among Muslims, we also find that the treatment effect is more strong among fundamentalists. Uh, so fundamentalists listen more strongly to uh, uh, what's, what is in the Quran. Uh, and we also find uh, there's no uh, um, direct effect of religious knowledge for Christians and Jews. There is, uh, for Christians and Muslims, a negative effect for Jews. But we find for Muslims that those who know more uh, about the Quran are actually more likely uh, to respond uh, with an increase in their support for violence than those who know little uh, about the Quran. So answers to the questions, uh, yeah, that, I think that's quite clear. So we do find that um, uh, legitimation of violence in religious scripture does matter and has actually an effect on people's attitudes towards violence. Is this a post hoc legitimation? No, it cannot be. Simply because of the design of the study. If, if it was a post hoc legitimation, we should not have find any such effect. You know, then people have an attitude and then they use post hoc. Uh, but here we see that actually presenting people with such a uh, quote has an effect. And that can have two uh, different mechanisms, um, but that's they are basically have the same consequence, so I'll leave it at that. Religious fundamentalism plays a very uh, large role. We can explain uh, a lot of the effect away by making this distinction between religious fundamentalists and non-religious fundamentalists. So the key of the problem is not Islam, but it's the fact that in Islam, religious fundamentalism currently has a very broad uh, adherence worldwide. Um, okay, then. Oops. Well, knowledge I already answered. Is there anything specific about Islam, current Islam? Yes, there is. We have a much higher uh, baseline level of support for religious violence uh, among Muslim re respondents. We also find that Muslims increase their support more strongly in uh, response to uh, a, a, a violence quote from religious scripture. And, and don't forget, such quotes are routinely part of the propaganda and the recruitment efforts of terrorist groups. So if we show that that actually works, that is something extremely important. And it also means that that is an, uh, an essential part of countering uh, terrorism uh, that is based on religious motivations. Um, yeah, and then we have the problem also that religious knowledge actually increases the susceptibility, especially of res uh, religious fundamentalists, to uh, the legitimation of violence. So the often advocated strategy, we have to inform people better about the content of the Quran, is not likely uh, to work if it is not accompanied by uh, something that goes beyond just uh, knowledge of the Quran, namely a different interpretation of the Quran, uh, a liberal interpretation. So um, countering fundamentalism and, and, and strengthening uh, liberal forms of Islam uh, is an important uh, part of the Solution. Um, yeah, let's keep the discussion of the uh, uh, solutions. You can read them here uh, for uh, the discussion. But but one thing uh, I would like to emphasize uh, at the end, before closing, uh, is what this means for uh, the question of homegrown uh, terrorism versus global terrorism. If you identify religious fundamentalism as the root cause of religious radicalization and religious violence, then of course we have to take note of the fact that religious Islamic fundamentalism and also Christian fundamentalism, which currently provide, <laughs> presents us with fewer problems, but that may change in the future. But currently the problem is mainly Islamic religious fundamentalism. This is a, a global movement. This is a global movement that is not just, uh, um, that just doesn't just take the form of 
terrorist organization organizations this is a, is a movement that also takes the form of regimes that are founded on an Islamist fundamentalist ideology and these regimes are not uninfluential and they're not small in number they include Iran they include Saudi Arabia they include Qatar they include uh, uh, Pakistan they include the northern states uh, of Nigeria that have Sharia law uh, and some of these states, moreover, have uh, large funds at their, at their disposal and have, um, uh, through decades of missionary work uh, in Western immigration countries, um, created uh, a basis of support, uh, not just for Salafists, but also for uh, um, ideologies um, um, oriented on the Muslim Brotherhood, a, a support base of uh, radical ideology uh, within Europe uh, and other U immigration countries. So, yeah, summing up, combating uh, religious fundamentalism, in my view, uh, is the key to combating terrorism.